Hello everyone and welcome back to the Tank Encyclopedia. In this episode, we will continue our in-depth look at the T-62 Soviet medium tank with an examination of its armor and its drivetrain. Structurally, the T-62 was a monocoque design, so the armor plates were also the load-bearing structure of the hull and turret. The welded hull was made up of medium hardness RHA plates of four main thicknesses, and the belly and engine deck plates were stamped out of thinner plates of several different thicknesses. Structurally, the armor took up 50% of the tank's total combat weight, the same percentage as on a T-54, and despite the larger internal volume of the T-62, its armor weight of 18.3 tons exceeded the armor weight of the T-54 by just 300 kilograms less than the weight that would have been gained from extending the hull sides alone. The designers kept the weight in check by carefully controlling the shape of the engine compartment and by shaving 4 millimeters off of the engine deck plates and the midsection of the hull belly. Otherwise, the design of the hull was broadly similar to that of a T-55, just slightly refined. The highlight was really the turret. Domed turrets were very much in vogue during the 1950s, and for the T-62, the choice of a well-rounded turret was motivated by many of the same design reasons. The rounded walls on domed turrets gave excellent ballistic protection for their weight, and were also beneficial in terms of withstanding blast waves, particularly nuclear blasts, since the shape made it harder for blast pressure pushing on the turret to damage the turret ring. The shape was also less intrusive to the commander's vision along the sides and rear compared to a boxy turret with a flat roof, allowing good vision without needing a tall commander's cupola to peek over the sides of the turret. This was particularly true for early T-62 models, which lacked a loader's cupola, so the commander's view over to the right was unimpeded. The T-62's turret had a larger internal volume than the T-55 turret, but weighed almost the same, and at the same time provided better protection. This miracle of engineering could be credited entirely to the use of a near-hemispherical shape. Mathematically, a sphere has the highest ratio of volume to surface area of any three-dimensional shape, and so a hemispherical turret requires the smallest mass of armor to cover a given internal volume. With that said though, for a tank turret, using a perfect hemisphere was obviously not ideal since the top, sides, and rear of the turret do not have to withstand the same amount of punishment as the front, so differentiating the armor slope angles and thicknesses was needed for optimal weight. For the T-62 turret, this was done in a very simple way. The designer simply drew two eccentric circles of different diameters to create smoothly contoured surfaces of variable thickness. They did this to form the shape of the turret walls in both the vertical and horizontal planes, and then added additional transitional curves to join the walls to the roof. This created progressive changes in the line of sight thickness from front to back and from base to roof, while maintaining the same effective thickness against AP rounds. The downside, of course, is that this shape made the protection of the turret very inconsistent against heat rounds, because the penetration power of most heat warheads remained the same regardless of the impact angle, up to a point. Hypothetically, there could be a situation where the front of the hull and the base of the turret could stop a weak heat warhead, perhaps from an anti-tank rifle grenade. But if the same grenade hit the turret somewhere below the roof but above the center line, it could penetrate. In general though, against tank-fired heat rounds, shoulder-fired anti-tank grenades, and ATGMs, this was all largely irrelevant. The concept of armor differentiation had also been applied to the hull, but because the T-62 inherited the hull armor profile of the T-55, it was in a similar situation to late production T-34-85 tanks. The turret had been substantially upgraded while the hull remained the same, and so their armor profiles were no longer completely harmonized, even though the T-62 turret was thinner than the Object 140 turret it was derived from. Originally, the frontal armor of the T-54 was only intended to stop the 8.8cm KWK-43 gun of the German Tiger II from point-blank range. The sides were only intended to protect against light anti-tank guns, with the Soviet 57mm S-60 anti-aircraft gun used as a surrogate in testing. The hull rear was intended to stop Soviet 14.5mm weapons from point-blank range. The T-62 hull had the same protection as the old T-54 hull in all aspects except the rear. 
The sloped rear plate of the T-54 hull had been flattened, so even though the same thickness was retained on the T-62 hull rear, it could no longer stop 14.5mm rounds from point-blank range. Excluding small details like this, the protection levels were practically equivalent. The T-62 turret, however, had better protection from every direction, front, sides, and rear. West German testing showed that the T-62 hull could be defeated by the 105mm DM-13 APDS round from a distance of 18,000 meters at its ballistic limit, defined as the maximum range at which it is possible to create a hull in the armor with 50% of the hits. Identical tests on the T-55 hull showed that the safety limit, defined as the guaranteed lack of perforation, was achieved at 2,000 meters. Fortunately for the T-55 and T-62, the M13 turned out to be very sensitive to the impact angle. At an impact angle of 63 degrees, which could be achieved if the hull was turned sideways by 25 degrees, the safety limit would drop to just 1,000 meters. Thanks to this rather low tolerance to high impact angles, the hull sides were also fairly capable if the hull was turned sideways by 20 to 25 degrees. The sides were only shot with overpressure test rounds, but from the data available, it could be extrapolated that the sides could be safe from DM-13 at a range of around 1,000 meters at those angles. The only penetrations were achieved with shots that landed directly next to the gunner's sight cutout, allowing them to burst through the side of the cutout and form cracks large enough for light to pass through. This led to the conclusion of the report that, quote, the turret is safe from frontal attack with APDS except for the following areas apertures for the gunner's optics and coaxial machine gun." Unquote. In documents published after these 1974 tests were completed, the T-62 turret was listed as being frontally protected against 105mm APDS from a range of 800 meters, indicating that if the turret was not hit from the direct front but from a side angle, it would not be quite so resilient as to stop DM-13 at point-blank range. But even so, having protection from 800mm and above can be considered excellent. The impact angles on the turret during the tests were fairly moderate, ranging from around 40 degrees to 50 degrees. Because of this, similar results might be expected from tungsten alloy APDS rounds, which were designed to perform better than tungsten carbide APDS rounds at high impact angles of 60 degrees and above, but had no advantage on moderately sloped targets of 30 to 50 degrees and actually had less penetration on flat and mildly sloped targets. If judged by both its turret and hull overall, the T-62 did not reach the protection level of tanks like the M60A1 and Chieftain, but its armor was still thick enough to give the enemy pause for thought, and thick enough to limit the damage if penetrated by 105mm APDS. The T-62 could also hold its own in terms of mobility against these much heavier tanks. Despite having a significantly weaker engine, the T-62 was considerably lighter than most other tanks, and its suspension had fairly wide tracks, giving the tank a fairly low ground pressure. The suspension featured five pairs of large rubber-rimmed aluminum road wheels, independently sprung with torsion bars, complete with unsupported all-steel tracks. In service, the T-62 was originally outfitted with the OM Shaw dead track like on T-55s and T-54s, but beginning in 1965, it received the heavier but more durable and efficient RM Shaw live track, which was still an all-metal track but had rubber bushings on the track pins. Due to the longer hull, T-62s fitted with the original OM Shaw track had 96 track links on each side rather than 90 track links as on the T-55, which slightly increased the unsprung mass of the suspension, but in return, the suspension had a longer ground contact length, giving a net reduction in the ground pressure. For tanks fitted with the RM Shaw tracks, a full set consisted of 97 links, and a T-62 with a full set of these tracks would increase the unsprung mass of its suspension by over 500 kilograms. A new drive sprocket was required for the new track, so directly swapping out one track for the other in the field was not possible without also having the right sprockets. Despite being much heavier, the benefits of the new RM Shaw track were overwhelming. Experimental data showed that, with the RM Shaw track, power losses in the suspension were reduced by an average of 20% compared to OM Shaw tracks. 
Dry friction between the track links and the track pins was eliminated and the rubber bushings dampened the oscillations of the unsupported upper track run, which induced large power losses at high speed on dead tracks. As a result, the average speed would be 15% faster than if the old OM Shaw tracks were fitted, and even the top speed was increased. The main feature of the T62 suspension that distinguished it from the T55 one when it was introduced was its new torsion bars, made from an improved steel alloy but retaining full interchangeability with the existing T55 suspension. Since the Ural Vagonzavod factory switched over from T55 production to T62 production, new T55s with the upgraded torsion bars were not built at UVZ, but the new torsion bars were used to upgrade existing tanks later on, when their suspensions wore out and needed overhauls. The power plant of the two tanks was also effectively the same. The T62 had essentially the same engine and essentially the same transmission. This was a V55V liquid-cooled, naturally aspirated V12 diesel engine. The only difference from the T55 one was that it had a more powerful generator to cope with the power needs of the T62's gun stabilizer. The generator was a clamp-on accessory that did not change the structural design of the engine itself. Compared to the basic V54 used in the T54 series, the V55 upped the power output from 520 horsepower to 580 horsepower, and this was done by having the engine put out more torque across the same range of engine speeds. The increase in power was therefore proportionally uniform across the entire power curve, which helped give the T62 and T55 better acceleration than the T54. Conveying this engine power to the tracks was done by a simple manual mechanical transmission with a multi-plate dry friction clutch and synchromesh gearbox of conventional design. The clutch was not on the engine, but rather placed at the input shaft of the gearbox, and the engine was connected to the gearbox by an intermediate gearbox. The intermediate gearbox was needed because of the transverse mount of the engine, but the location of the clutch was for space-saving reasons. A rather noteworthy feature of the intermediate gearbox is that it had a gear ratio of 0.7 to 1, unlike most other tank gearboxes of the time, where there was a reduction bevel gear between a longitudinally mounted engine and a transverse gearbox. By reducing the torque flowing out of the engine using a 0.7 to 1 gear ratio, it was possible to reduce the stress in the clutch and use smaller gears and power shafts in the gearbox and final drives, which in turn reduced the size and weight and reduced the rotating mass in the drivetrain. This was particularly important for decreasing the stress from inertial forces in the gears whenever they sped up and slowed down with the tank. In turn, the gearbox itself had low reduction ratios except in first gear and reverse, thereby reducing the stress on the final drives, particularly in the long term, as much more time was spent driving in higher gears than in first, second, or reverse, both in peacetime and during the war. In fact, a peacetime study found that most of the driving time in the T-54 and T-55 tanks was spent in third gear during both summer and winter conditions, on dirt roads and off-road. For this reason, the T-62 gearbox had a reinforced third gear. The weakest link in the powertrain of the T-62 was the fourth gear owing to poor lubrication. For some reason, with the constant rotation of the gears keeping oil circulating in the gearbox through the transverse partitions, there would be less oil ending up at the fourth gear than in all others. This issue was never solved and was only acceptable due to the relatively infrequent usage of the fourth gear. The concept of implementing minimal gear reductions in the drivetrain until the final drives became common after World War II, both in tanks and in commercial vehicles designed to bear heavy loads across difficult terrain, including tractors and off-roading trucks. The transmissions of tanks like the Centurion and the Patton series were also designed according to this concept, and both tanks used spur gear final drives with a high reduction ratio. Out of all the positive effects from this design solution, the most important for the T-62 was that it increased the service life of all drive units downstream of the intermediate gearbox. Steering was accomplished using two-stage planetary reduction gears, one for each track. This mechanism allowed the tank to do gentle turns with a free radius, geared turns, or clutch brake turns. When the steering tiller was pulled back by one step, the clutch pressure plate would first be released and then a band brake would be tightened around the sun gear of the planetary set, engaging a gear reduction mode. If the steering tiller was not pulled far enough, the track would merely be declutched, 
Pulling the steering tiller back further a second step, release the steering brake and tighten the service brake band, allowing the tank to perform clutch brake turns. An interesting side benefit of using geared reduction to steer the tanks is that it was possible for the driver to effectively downshift one gear by pulling both steering tillers back, since the change in overall gear ratio would be the same as if he downshifted the gearbox. This was the preferred method to temporarily increase the traction for the tank for obstacle crossing or short hill climbing, since the driver did not need to take his foot off the accelerator and lose engine power to perform an actual downshift. The final drives were shared with the T55 and were an improvement over the initial T54 design. Instead of a direct spur gear design, the T62 final drives were a significantly more durable two-stage compound type with a spur gear pair to perform the first reduction and a planetary gear set to perform the second reduction. The T62 was a fairly mobile tank at the tactical and operational levels. It had a large fuel capacity and its engine was relatively efficient, so a T62 unit could march and fight for several days without refueling. According to the figures given in the T-62's technical manual, which was written using the results of military field tests, the fuel consumption per 100 kilometers would be 300 to 330 liters when traveling on dirt roads, cross country, and 190 to 210 liters when traveling on paved roads. The driving range of the tank with its integral fuel supply was 450 kilometers on paved roads and 320 kilometers on dirt roads. With the addition of two fuel drums, the driving range was extended to 650 kilometers on paved roads and 450 kilometers on dirt roads. The onboard fuel carried in a T-62 was divided between four internal Bakelite-coated steel tanks, holding 675 liters, and three external tanks on the fenders with a capacity of 285 liters, for a total capacity of 960 liters. A pair of external 200-liter fuel drums could be mounted into the rear of the hull for extended range. The tank could ford a water obstacle up to 1.4 meters in depth without preparation, or a snorkel up to 5.0 meters if the need arose. On a march, field tests found that the average speed on roads was 32 to 35 kilometers per hour, or 22 to 27 kilometers per hour when driving over a variety of dirt roads and off-road terrain types. If there was a stretch of road long enough, a T-62 driver could try to hit the absolute top speed of 55.83 km per hour. In terms of acceleration, according to the same 1974 West German tests mentioned earlier, a T-62 would take 22.75 seconds to reach 40 km per hour on a paved road. For comparison, a Leopard 1 tank also involved in the tests could do it in just 14.2 seconds. The M60A1 with the early T97E2 track needed 25 seconds, but if it was fitted with the more durable but heavier T142 track, the acceleration time rose to 30 seconds. Soviet testing found that the Chieftain Mark 5R required an even longer time of 34 to 35 seconds to reach the same speed. The mountain climbing capabilities of the tank were fairly average, though perhaps its light weight helped on fragile mountain roads. Officially, the maximum slope surmountable by the T-62 was 32 degrees, and the maximum side slope it could drive on was 30 degrees. However, due to the lack of a torque converter, starting and accelerating from a stop on a steep grade of 31 degrees was difficult. Shifting gears when driving up a steep slope was also practically impossible, so drivers had to rely on the gear reduction of the steering units as a surrogate for downshifting or upshifting when a change in traction was necessary. And that concludes our third video on the T-62. Next up will be a look at its foreign users and a brief overview of this veteran's combat deployment. Until then, let us know what you thought of the T-62's armor and mobility. Would increasing the hull armor have been worse with the increased weight, or should it have ditched more armor to be faster? Let us know in the comments. Until next time, keep us in your sights.